ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a big round of applause for Dr. Snuggles, please, everyone, who's been doing this. You may know him as Bruce. Um, so before I get started, actually, when I was in Norwich, I had some visitors from Romania recently. I was, I was actually doing an accessibility workshop for them, and they spent seven hours trying to teach me one single Romanian expression, which is... Buna Sierra Bucharest. I was really worried because they had conclusion, you know, they didn't really know how to talk about it. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about paper prototyping. Um, something you'll notice, that you'll notice there's a bit of discrepancy between the way I've done my slides versus uh, Supersoul slides in the last one. That was all sort of futuristic and 3D and amazing and uh, with audio going around your head and all of that stuff. Not so much in my presentation here, it's a bit more sort of rudimentary and low-fi. Uh, the first reason for that is because I can't do the sort of stuff that uh, SuperSol does, but also because with paper prototyping it is all about doing stuff in a rough sort of way. Uh, you'll also notice that it's animated, uh, and the reason it's animated is not really anything to do with the theme of paper prototyping, it's more that I discovered a type of food recently, uh, which is essentially honeycomb, which is dipped in sugared yogurt. And before, I could only get honeycomb in crunchy bars, and I can't eat them because they have chocolate around them. Uh, and that gives me migraines. Uh, so when I discovered this alternative, I ate a lot of it very quickly. Uh, and so I got a bit carried away and animated all of my slides. So, uh, <laughs> if you're interested in doing this kind of animation yourself, this sort of cell animation, where it's actually, it's like traditional animation, like you get a Miyazaki film or something, I have got a, um, a little repo there, and there's a, there's a SAS mix in which can help you do that sort of stuff. That, I'm afraid, <laughs> is all of the technical content in my talk. That is it. Uh, because even though um, I have a bit of a reputation for doing talks about code, uh, specifically about the sort of finer points of CSS, you can sort of see the scribbled out um, quantity query selector in the background there. I'm actually a designer, like my, my role is lead designer, I have been for the last few years. So to me, code isn't like the thing that really excites me and arouses me and gets my rocks off on its own, it's just more of a means to an end. Uh, but it's an important means to an end if you're working on the web, because that's part of the medium, right? So I think it's good for designers to know a bit of code, but as well as code, you also want to maybe incorporate some writing. So actually writing content and designing the structure of that content is really important. That's a design process. It's not often uh, considered design in the aesthetic sense, but it's, it's a very important thing to structure. Um, the stuff that people are coming to your website for, but also to write about perhaps how you would go about solving the problems um, for the website in the, in the other realms of design. So actually just writing down ideas and sharing them and editing them and that sort of thing. So there's that. <coughs> sketching, of course, so sometimes actually sketching the approximations of things, how they would look, but also maybe drawing mind maps, like if you're doing like uh, uh, user-centered design, actually um, drawing like here is a person, Let's imagine what they're like, what are their fam what's their family like, what's their work life, what are their hopes and fears. Drawing things out in a sort of a visual way like that just to uh, work conceptually. Also talking, I find, is a really important part of the design process too. Uh, it's always good to have an honest person around so you can say, hey, I've come up with this idea for design, so they can go, that's really not a good idea. And I tend to ignore most people, but I do ask, so I'm halfway there. Um, and the last thing is thinking. It's always a good idea to think as part of your design process as well. Although I tend to find that all five things uh, on the screen there, thinking is usually the one which is squeezed out of the budget, isn't it? But, you know, never mind. Um, and all of those things, I think, in my opinion, in a proper creative process, should happen in a sort of a non-linear way. You should be able to dip in and out of them. I'll maybe I'll do a bit of drawing, because that, that might be a good way of expressing uh, a design idea that I have, or, you know, just not being, not being in a strict sort of linear process, uh, because I think that can maybe cause some problems. Uh, to try and sort of explain what I mean, imagine if we had a linear process where we started with thinking at the very beginning, and we did all of our thinking up front, and we did things like, we just sat in a room and shouted stuff at each other like WordPress and Aquamarine Blue 
uh, and, and uh, onboarding and stuff like that. We all went, oh yeah, yeah, that sounds really interesting. Let's all, uh, let's all yeah, think about that some, some not sagely. Um, and then we decided we absolutely we've done the thinking. We'll stop with the thinking part and we'll move on to drawing. So no more thinking is allowed now. To make sure that no one does any thinking during the drawing stage, because you don't want that. Because if people start thinking then, then they might question the ideas you had in the first place, and they might be drawing so they can go, shit, that was a really bad idea. You don't want that because that would break up the whole process, which of course is sacred. So what you have to do is you have to lobotomize everyone who's involved in the whole process. Delegate someone to do that, maybe it's a project manager, maybe it's a sort of design lead, whatever. I've had to the work most people, sometimes I ask someone else to do it. Um, so what you're going to have to do is add something to your, your front-end development toolkit. You know it's important to have tools, and tooling is a really big thing these days. The tool that you'll need specifically for this is a drill. So what you're going to have to do is just come up to people and just drill them in, in, into the frontal lobe. Just drill, drill, drill as you go around the room until everyone can't think anymore, and then, then you know that you've moved on to the next stage. Incidentally, I was thinking to myself, having a paper drill and doing that mining, like making people not being able to think anymore, might be a bad idea for a talk, but in paper prototyping, it's really easy just to throw things away, I'd say, say I won't do that again. Um, so after the drawing, of course, we then move on to coding. Uh, so we've got all of our designs, our visual designs laid out, and we think to ourselves, great, we'll just code that up. So obviously we can't we still have things, so it's not like zombies just smashing up keyboards, and inevitably it all leads to failure. So, yeah, it'd be bad if that sort of thing happened in our industry, but it never, ever, ever does, so it's, it's absolutely fine. Um, it would also be a shame if we had very, very prescribed roles. So if we had uh, a way of looking at people like that person is very much a designer and that person is very much a coder. Just quickly as a show of hands, how many people in here would call themselves a designer, or at least partly a designer? Not too many today. And how many a developer or a front end developer, something like that? Okay. And how many a um, fisherman? Okay, that's, that's a few actually. I think you might want to be in the other conference hall. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it would be a real shame. If, let's, let's imagine that this guy here, yeah, let's give him a nice Romanian name like Catalin or Vidyu. Um, he's doing some, um, some uh, sketching, but really his role is programmer. But he's doing the sketching so that he can uh, grasp the ideas that he wants to turn into code eventually. So he's not just picking up the code to start with. He's, he's drawing maybe a map of the control structure or something like that. I find that that's really useful. I work next to someone, actually, I have them for a long time, whose desk is, um, is you can draw on it. It's like a, the whole desk is a whiteboard so that they can just scribble things and wipe it out. And they're a programmer, really, that's their role. It would be a real shame if he did his best work that way. He works by starting out like that. It would be a shame if someone came along <laughs> it's like, no, you can't do that because you're a coder. What you should be doing is just cranking out code. But like, don't think about it, don't actually find a way to do it well. Just, you know, if you're not writing lines of code which I can count, then you know, you're wasting company time. That would be a shame as well, wouldn't it? Uh, paper prototyping in and of itself can't solve all these problems, but I do hope that paper prototyping and adopting some paper prototyping can bring some of the fun, some of the fluidity back into the creative design process. And it can involve a lot of people too. And to explain why I think that, I want to talk a little bit about the history of design and its relationship to the web. So if you look at this crude uh, timeline here, uh, you've got the start of the web over there, and what we have now here. So at the start of the web we had um, just sort of basic static documents. They were interconnected with hyperlinks. Uh, Stephen uh, showed us the, the original web, uh, web page that was made there by TMBL. Um, and it was like computer scientists and academics mostly involved in that part of the web. And now everything that we do is sort of NZIFI, doesn't it? We sort of we contextify and uh, browserify and whatify. And it's, yeah, it's just very complex. And you can do really cool stuff like Supersoft was talking about, like uh, 3D WebGL and audio effects and all of that. It's all of that great stuff that we like. So somewhere around here. Um, what was, uh, happened is that we got some ways of doing, um, like enhancing the way that the web is kind of a visual design platform. 
So, uh, images weren't part of the original HTML specification, but they came along later. I've worked with some troglodytes who <laughs> still maintain that there shouldn't be any images on the web. And from one point of view, it would be really good for performance if we didn't have any images on the web. Uh, and also we have uh, we had CSS, which of course was a bit later than that. At this stage, in the evolution of the web, a group of people who weren't originally involved got really interested in it, and they called themselves designers. They were these sort of aesthetes, and I suppose it's sort of a generalisation, but they usually uh, usually uh, depict it as a pipe smoking, mustachioed white guy. Which isn't true, of course, it's just a generalisation, as I say, but that's a sort of symbolic way of looking at it. So they thought, oh, well, now the World Wide Web is a place where I can exercise my, um, my skills and I can, I can contribute to the web, so that's really good. So what they did is they built a rocket called the SS Decontextualisation, and they flew themselves at the web with a mission to save all of the people who were currently involved in the web, all of the computer scientists and academics and all of those people, from their design decrepitude. They, they decided that they, they, these people can do design. We need, to, we need to bring design to that area. Uh, which is a bit sort of audacious given that the web, even at that stage, was the greatest thing that was ever designed. So as you can see, that there's a sort of a theme which is going to emerge here about definitions of design. Um, and what were they good at? What did they bring to the web? Well, they were very good at sort of laying things out in a very particular way, mostly on uh, flattened bits of dead tree of uh, a very particular size and shape. Uh, and making things look exactly right in terms of proportion, but also um, playing with consistent and dependable colours and shades and that sort of thing. Uh, so they could be very exacting because the medium allowed them to be. Um, what they uh, used to do before the web, and this, these sort of skills apply very well to these areas, was making things like album covers, uh, um, brochures, that sort of thing, and of course typesetting books. And these are all great skills, but um, I guess I'm wondering what their role is really in the web, and how big a role there is for this sort of things in the web. Things that they're not so good at designing, this particular group of people, are hats. Uh, Partly because hats are not made of paper, unless you make a paper hat, obviously there are just an exception that proves the rule. Uh, but hats are usually made out of fabric, so they're more of a textile thing, also three-dimensional. Uh, and also these are people who are involved in visual design primarily, and you can't see a hat because it's on your head. So, um, bridges, large structures, um, weight-bearing structures, which depends on a lot of um, engineering knowledge and, and uh, skill in that area, of mathematics, that sort of stuff. Not so great at that as well. Make them out of paper, not so brilliant. Pantones, that's not going to stop uh, you know, a lorry falling into a river. So there's that. And also, to some extent, web pages. Uh, so <laughs> it, it sort of became obvious, I think, the most clear lesson we've had in the last few years that that, that kind of design doesn't have quite such an importance or an influence on the web was responsive design when we finally came to the realisation that, well, yeah, actually, everything is fluid and flexible. We can't depend on the thing that we're going to design on being the same size and shape, the same stock, and to reproduce the same colours. Um, all of these different streams, of course, different sizes, but also the colours are different, etc., etc. And you'll get different experiences on different networks. Some people will send you different amounts of content and things like that. That's not always in the uh, decision-making of the designer themselves. Um, but it goes a bit further than that. Uh, some things, um, some people um, actually view the web not completely non-visually, and I work in accessibility, so, so that's the sort of an area that I'm interested in. Uh, and they might just consume what we've made, the content that we've made for the web, uh, just by touch, or um, by touch they would interact with it, and by sound they would, they would get feedback, and they would they'd be able to interpret the information. And that puts pressure on this philosophical idea of design being a visual thing, even at all. So that's still something that has to be consumed by a human being, it's still an interface, it's just not a visual interface. So it still has to be designed, even though you can't see it. Um, so really, this term designer that this particular group of people used was a bit of a, a, a truncation, it was, a, it, was a, it was shorthand really for something much more specific. And that very specific thing is print-based graphical communication design. 
they do have a role in the web, but it's smaller perhaps than what we thought first thought. The truth is that a lot of the web has to be designed, and when I say designed, I mean in the true sense of what designs, and that's thought about carefully before doing it, so you don't fuck it up. Data structures, for instance, so uh, let me give you an example. Uh, the difference between a array of objects and a set of names properties. Uh, depending on what you're trying to achieve, the first might be better or worse than the latter. And making the decision, discerning between those two things, is a design decision, even though it's not something that the user would even be aware of or uh, be aware that you'd even contemplated. The same with APIs. Um, APIs uh, ideally are both featureful and don't have a tremendous learning curve. So striking that balance between having all of the things that people want but not overloading them is a question of design. It's like it's, it's almost the same as you know um, if you're designing a car, the amount of space you want inside it, you still want it to be light, etc. And of course, the interactions. That's an important part too. But unfortunately, uh, and this is one of my favourite quotes. I'm just going to move my cursor out of the way because I turn away. When all you have is lifting, everything looks like a pig. And because um, we sort of delegated all design work, or at least we use the term designer, just to talk about a very specific group of people who do visual communication design, we tend to think of something as badly designed simply on the basis that um, perhaps it doesn't look that good. I've seen loads of stuff which looks dreadful, which is really fun or really good to use or can be usable, accessible or accessible. Uh, Imagine this, uh, take this conference for instance. Imagine if I was a designer who was very particular about the way things looked and I was asked to judge this conference. Now, I'm standing in front of lots of beautiful people who have listened to me attentively and I'm very grateful. I've seen lots of great talks. Um, the speaker's dinner was great. Everything was organised great. I got my flight when I wanted it. Um, we've all come here together. The microphone hasn't cut out. You know, it's all worked really well. But, what if I was the sort of person who saw all of that and was enjoying all of that and then took a few steps back, like this, just really carefully and went, I'm not sure about the kerning <laughs> of this. And then it deemed the whole conference a failure. Now, by the way, I didn't, I didn't think there was any bad kerning going on there, but it's sort of missing the point. Uh, so we sort of labor under what I call this tyranny of pixel protection, uh, which is where we, are, we think that the exactitude of how certain things look um, is a measure of their success or how good they are. And one of the main problems we have in this in the design process is we get into this problem of showing something that we've designed to someone uh, and getting them to judge our subjective decisions, what fonts we've used, what colours we've used, whether we've used bevels or, or rounded corners and that sort of stuff. None of which tell us anything about whether it's a viable product at all, but we end up basically saying, behold this beautiful thing. And it's a very personal thing that we're asking people to judge as well, not a functional, uh, objective thing. Uh, and you get this sort of stalemate situation, where on the one hand you have the designer going, please don't hate it, and on the other side the guy going, I'm not going to tell you whether I like it or not because I don't want to offend you. Um, at this stage I'm just going to mention, by the way, nearest screens is an important part of this talk. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So what we did is we moved away from doing high fidelity mock-ups, or uh, at least some of us have, which I think is kind of cool. So now we're sort of more focusing on uh, laying things out, but making, making sure that things look scruffy and not like it's designed or finished, so that we get more honest feedback about how it's laid out rather than how it is aesthetically. But unfortunately, um, we don't so much uh, cover this other area, and I think Adrian Engel this is quite well. You can't learn more about function from fully designed PSC than you can from description of crumpled napkin. And uh, I think that's quite true. Uh, so we need to be trying to prototype functionality uh, as well as avoid getting into that whole uh, business of arguing over the particular shape of blue or whatever it is, because that always completely derails all of the important work we're doing in terms of UX. So this is where I think, and it's only one way to approach these problems, this is where I think paper prototyping comes in. So I'm going to talk to you about paper prototyping, about how I go about it, the tools that you need and everything. So first of all, we're going to have to go shopping to get some stuff to do the paper prototyping with. Now, I didn't really like this part because I like to be able to sit at my desk with my headphones on listening to ambient music. And if I want something, just do NPN install, right? Because that's nice and easy, I don't have to get up or whatever. But I, 
With paper photos, I'm going to have to go to a shop and say, hello, Mr. Patel, can I get some bits and pieces? But I'm going to make it feel a bit more developer y, like, it would, like you could install it on NPM or whatever, um, by, um, by giving some of the stuff you need for paper photos, I mean, the sort of terminology that you would expect from a sort of enterprise uh, node base, whatever. So, the first thing you're going to need for paper prototyping is tactile interface templates or to use a vernacular, pieces of paper. Uh, you're going to need large pieces of paper, that's really important. But also, you're going to need small pieces of paper too. Uh, the large pieces of paper, well I'm really talking A2 size, like that sort of size, because uh, even though you're probably, and this is a bit ironic, but even though you're probably designing for a small screen, um, you want to um, actually prototype on a much larger area. And the reason for that is you have lots of people gathered around the table when you're testing, and even perhaps if you're collaborating, building this uh, prototype. Everyone needs to see what's going on. So if someone's like using something and they don't really know how it works, and you want to sort of, maybe that's something you can tweak or fix, everyone should be able to see what's happening. So it's important that it's big. Smaller bits of paper, just by then because you're lazy, because you, you know you don't have to chop up the larger bits really, uh, and that's expensive cutting up large bits of paper. And probably just scuff it up a bit, you know, just kind of uh, make it look a bit crap, make it dog-eared and whatever. It's really important that you're approachable. This is the most important lesson uh, that I've discovered from doing this: is that uh, if you go into a session with people, you're you want to. Give the impression that you're working with them. You're not coming down on a high as a designer and saying, this is the thing we've built. You know, uh, be impressed. Uh, you want to actually sort of uh, get people involved. And the best way to do that is to make yourself look sort of semi-incompetent. It's a good idea to come in like maybe wearing like not so great clothes, uh, maybe smelling a little bit of drugs, <laughs> that sort of stuff. And to be honest, that actually really works. That actually that people are like, oh, they like us, and, and we're making something together. That's cool. So, they're not necessarily on drugs, like, anyway. um, uh, So you're also going to need, next of all, intense manifestation dispensers, uh, or pens, as I like to call them. Uh, and you're only allowed to have four different colour pens, black, blue, uh, red, and green. Because they all have to denote something, they all have to actually have meaning. Um, so it's not, it's not a colouring in exercise, you don't get to have yellow, because that doesn't, that doesn't really mean anything. And certainly not pink, pink is a horrible colour. <laughs> you want to avoid pink as much as possible. Um, so the blacks just for doing a basic, basic like laying stuff out and actually doing the like, scaffolding and uh, most of the drawing. Blue, just follow web conventions. You're, you're sort of, I mean, I just the web applications. This could work also for native applications. But to me, blue means something interactive. So if there's a button or a link, do it in blue, and then you will get what you mean. Red, bad, you've done something wrong, or there's an error somewhere else. And green, you know, the opposite. It's success, you've sent a message, or that kind of thing. You're also going to need bridging technologies, or uh, sticky tap and sticky tape. These have uh, slightly different functions. The sticky tape is for um, sort of permanently um, stitching bits of the application together. The classic thing I like to do is like when in an application where you press a button to reveal hidden content, I would do that in a paper prototype by sellotaping a hinge and having the other bit of content folded underneath. If during testing the tester presses the button, then you can just unfold it like that. So that's for permanently holding things together. Whereas the sticky tag is for non-permanently doing it. And now we're going to get into the realm of modularity. And we hear a lot about modularity in real applications. Modularity in paper prototypes as well. It's supposed to mimic the same sort of thing. I feel slightly ashamed of this slide because I'm sort of showing you how to use sticky tack, like on Ikea. But basically, uh, if you put sticky tack in the four corners of a bit of card to get something out, then they will adhere. Uh, but the cool thing is you can pick it up and move it. So during testing and during um, uh, tweaking, you can actually pick it up and say, it doesn't look good there, let's move it here, change it all really easily. Uh, the other cool thing you can do is you, you might start out with some interface text, and um, you're testing with someone and they just really don't like that interface text. You always have two chances then, because you can pick it up, take the blue tag off, put it on the other side, flip it open, you've got a blank side to change the text. Um, I, I work with um, young people, vulnerable people, and there's certain trigger things that they don't like to read or hear, 
I don't, I'm not necessarily aware of them. There might be a button, uh, there's one example, there was a button which said help. They didn't like help, they didn't like the idea of pressing help because it made them feel like they were being helpers. Changed it to info or something like that, but it was really quick and easy to do with a paper program. Uh, you're also going to need quantum interaction polymer, which is transparent plastic, basically just, uh, just sheets of transparent plastic. And the reason for that is uh, you can then you can prototype like inputs, really. So you can get a bit of card, sell a tape on the plastic, and get a dry white marker. So sorry, I was lying before. You can get one other pen, a dry white marker, and then it will be like filling out a form. And then you know maybe if you fill that that field, you can move it away or whatever you do. But um, that's really nice because then you can actually put personal information in, and you can you can test like difficult things. Uh, like login forms and that sort of stuff. And so what you do is you have all of this stuff on a big enough table as you can, you sit in a room for two or three hours um, uh, with the scent of, of pens wafting through your nostrils and you start piecing things together. And again, you can be modular. Um, you can have like, uh, this would be the viewport, you can have the navigation at the top and um, you don't need to make that several times, you don't need to like recreate that for every page. You don't need to move pages a lot. You can actually have stuff which stays in place. Like you, you know, like in um, uh, an old, old school PHP, you have includes. You can sort of um, shoot things like includes or, or partials. I think we probably call it uh, when you're using handlebars templating or something like that. And then you can just pull in and out the actual content for each slide. So this might be like a, a single page application. You press create. You can even have the little strip underneath there which says you're on the you're on that current place and you can move that from place to place, that's a bit blue tack holding that down, move that around. And it, it, you begin to build something which kind of actually works like like a a high fidelity interactive uh, prototype, but it's much more approachable and technology agnostic. Um, you can get a lot more ambitious as well, it doesn't just have to be bits of paper and drawing and stuff. Uh, one time I was working on an app where someone did a prototype and they got some cork board from, a, from like a notice board that you'd have on the wall, uh, took that down, uh, put the map over the top which was drawn on a bit of card and used actual pins. Now whether or not that uh, mapping application that we were working on actually convinced people that it was better, a better application because of that, I don't know. But because it was familiar and tactile and it was analogous to a digital map, it engaged people more and it, it made it more fun. Um, I also uh, work as a lead designer on this project, the Great British Public Toilet. Now, there's a real project uh, and because there's not a lot of data about where to go to the toilet in the, in the UK. So we mashed up some data and I did the interface for that. But I did a paper prototype first. And I had some, um, I made some map pins which were toilets. Uh, so I just drew those hurriedly, cut them out. And when we were testing it, one of the testers said, uh, I happen to know a bit about toilet, which is kind of a funny thing to hear anyway, but they, we, we had sort of, sort of people who might use this app, but we also had some toilet experts. I'm not even kidding, there's like, a, there's like a, an association of like, uh, toilet people. They came along, so we're very privileged to have them, obviously. And they said, well, well this, this, this can't pass, we can't have these, these things like this, because actually a lot of toilets, they're not sit down toilets. You can't do a poo in in some of the toilets that we, the data tells us that that's not true. So you wouldn't want to have that, a pin representing a toilet on a map, and you turn up there and it's just a trough, you know, like a urinal, especially, you know, I mean, that would mean it's a male toilet only as well. So, uh, where am I going with this? Oh yeah, no, so what it is, is that um, I could just take these pins off and I could um, tear them up and replace them with other pins really quickly and easily. Um, whereas, you know, if, if we were doing it in a sort of a, non paper prototype y quick sort of way. Um, I might have spent ages like drawing really nice porcelain toilets with really like realistic curves and everything in sketch. And then we'd be at that point where we go, well we've spent two weeks doing that, we'll stick with them anyway. And then everyone will be trying to go to the toilet in the wrong type of toilet. So yeah, we managed to avoid that. Uh, the other thing that I uh, managed to achieve, and I'm quite proud of this with a paper prototyping, was there was one client they were convinced that their whole application should be divided up into separate pages. But really the underlying thing, which was, which was an interactive document to help you apply for uh, benefits in the UK, was really just one document. Uh, so I said, actually I think you should go on all, all, all on one page and we should just navigate between that. 
Fortunately, and this doesn't happen very often, I know, but they actually had all of their content because it had been like government, government approved like 14 years earlier or something. So I got all of their content printed out on A4, laid it all out along the office, just sort of, I'm going to dodge the camera along the, along the office like this, sellotaped it all together, and then I made this viewport, as you can see on the screen. And I said to the client, I said, well, where do you want to go? And they went, well, I want to read such and such session. How, how am I supposed to do that? And I just picked up and went, shh, like that, put it down, you know, where the head it was. And they're like, oh, no, I quite like that. I quite like that motion as well. So, I mean, that's just a CSS animation, really, isn't it? So, so I convinced them that scrolling was okay, which is quite hard, isn't it? But a paper prototype helped me to do this. Um, so, demoing. This is obviously a, um, a big part of paper prototype. is actually showing off and getting them to use it and seeing what they think. Uh, and getting their feedback. Uh, and with them, I mean, you'll need, you'll need two people who are the testers. Hopefully, like, from... There shouldn't be, like, your colleagues. That's really important. There should be someone who's likely to actually use it. You know, so, someone from the actual audience. So try and source people like that. And it's important you have two. Because if there's one, they'll just sit in front of it and look at you and look at it and be too nervous to speak. But if there's two sitting next to each other, then you'll be able to create a dialogue, and that's where you'll get the feedback from. Then talking about it, saying, this shit, isn't it? And you can write that down. Um, you'll also need some facilitators, of course. So I'm usually on the left, who's the guy who just writes the notes and that sort of stuff. Because I've, I've normally I've made the paper prototype, so it's not really for me to power it. Um, but the other guy is the computer, if you like. He's the person who's driving the application. He's the browser, or, or whatever you want to call it. Because it's interactive, he has to make it move around, he or she has to make it move around and change, change things about uh, as the tester is pressing things. So that's important too. Um, and he's depicted as a robot, obviously, because he's pretending to sort of be a machine. Um, so you need to, before you begin, lay out a user story or a task. Um, you don't want to be doing a paper prototyping session and people on the huge like inputs that you've made out of card and acetate, uh, be writing in personal details for you to see because it's awkward and also there's legal uh, problems there. So so get them to even even if they're sort of uh, someone from the audience you're looking at, don't actually get them to be themselves. Get them to like role play. And that's important. Um, use your figures. This is this is came from my colleague and uh, uh, former boss Harry. We used to do web applications for desktop, that's where we, where we started. And uh, he always used to say, when, you, when you're testing this, um, use your finger like it's a mouse. And now with the huge proliferation of touch devices, he just says, use your finger like a finger. So it's nice and clear, really, I suppose. Just, just press it like you would your screen on your, on your iPad or whatever. Uh, and really important is we are testing the app, not you, and I've sort of got my t-shirt sort of represents this, test usability, not users. Um, so it's, it's important to actually say, if you can't use it, if it's, if it's rubbish and, and you, you don't actually know how to navigate this thing and get the best out of it, that's because we've messed up, not you, okay? So we're the ones who've, who've got it wrong. So it's, it's really important to instill that view because otherwise it feel really fresh. So this is sort of an aerial view of everything going on. Uh, this would be me sitting at the bottom. So I'm sitting in a sort of a neutral position there. The idea is that um, from that angle, I'm looking at the app, not the people using the app. Um, so that's sort of following on from the whole, oh, we're not testing you thing. Um, one person probably of the testers should be using the app functionally, actually pressing things, because if you have two people doing that simultaneously, that's going to get irritated for everyone and you won't get anywhere. And the other person is a sort of a more of a passive part who's going to be chatting with them and saying, oh, press that, press that, or whatever they're doing. Uh, and then, of course, this guy here on the left is the computer, and he has a lot of work to do because as soon as anything happens, uh, as soon as they press something, he's going to have to actually put together the other sort of um, stock bits of prototype which are hidden away and smooth things around and put it back on the screen. Depending on how complex the application is, that can take a little bit of time, which is why you need one of these. Um, which is a spinner, um, like Tobias was talking about, and mine's a sort of a crappy looking uh, paper prototype one. Uh, and where to put the spinner if you're doing this um, kind of thing. The best place to do it is to put it on your forehead because you're going to need both hands to move things around. I actually got one here for me today. 
because I thought to myself, what if I lose my place in my talk? And I've suddenly on the slide and I've got all my notes where I think I could just do that whilst I probably bugged around trying to get things wrong. Um, so yeah, so you're going to need to um, need to uh, have one of those handy. Of course, you need to explain to the testers what that represents in case they don't recognise the symbol. Otherwise, they're just going to think that you're, you've got a little bit uh, odd. Uh, just sticking things to yourself in the middle of the session. So uh, the schedule will go something a bit like this. Uh, you will test with a pair of people. So this will be like a, a throughout a day or the best part of the day. Um, we usually start at 11 and then finish at about 4 actually or something like that because it's really tiring for everyone involved. But testing with pair one. And then, and this is crucial, with pair one and any stakeholders and whoever else was, was a sort of a, a passive party there watching what was going on, actually together make changes based on the notes that you've made in that first session. And that's where paper prototypes are really strong because you can actually get people involved and say, what was it you said, like you said that that bit didn't work for you or whatever. Oh yeah, well, what I meant was this. And then you can actually get some spare, but this is important, bring some spare paper and lots of pens. And you can start actually making bits of uh, prototype like that. So uh, the important thing there is the difference between that and a high fidelity prototype like actually made out of code um, is that the changes aren't just made by a front end dev who's like really nervously trying to bash things out and hoping that he doesn't lose the crap Wi Fi connection in the council offices that you're in or whatever it is. Uh, and then you do testing with pair two, of course, with the, with the new paper prototype after you've messed it out and hurriedly chopped things up, and you go through the day like that. And by the end of the day, you should be left with a pile of notes and, of course, a few tears because even though we've, we've sort of um, astute uh, focusing on sort of personal details and, and things which are around taste, if you like, things like fonts, typography, and, and colours. We're still making decisions as designers, or we will have done it in our paper prototype. And if, it, and if there's lots wrong with it, then it's going to, you know, it's quite difficult to bear. But as long as you've had a session where a lot of that stuff happens, and look, there is a lot of complaints and there is a lot of problems and improvements that can be made, you've had a really good session although a tearful one. Uh, and then, at that stage, and only at that stage, would you start to decide what you might make it out of. If you've done a, a, a digital prototype meta using some sort of platform already, like Meteor or WordPress or whatever, then naturally it's going to be moving in the direction of what that framework wants you to do and how you want to make something. Doing it this way is totally technology agnostic. You're just playing with paper. You might get to a stage where you think, this thing we've made out of paper cannot be made out of pixels. But that's very rare, because when you break it down like that, usually you're, you're only focusing on the simplest of things anyway. That does tend to keep things nice and simple. Um, so, in summary, uh, this kind of paper prototyping isn't sketching, it's not just drawing things. It's, uh, it's an interactive, you're making something which is interactive. So you're getting to prototype the actually important, definitive part of what the web is. It's an interactive medium. Whereas a lot of our prototyping doesn't do that. Uh, and it's fun as well, so that's good. Uh, and it's technology agnostic. It doesn't drive you in a particular direction in terms of what technology you use to later realize the actual product. And the best thing about it is it's democratic. Um, everyone in the testing sessions, like I said, can get involved in actually um, changing the prototype and moving things around. Um, and uh, it doesn't have to be the, uh, the visual designer, the person who's very good at those uh, laying things out and making things just so, those designers which are really visual communication designers who actually do the paper prototyping. It could be a Python developer or a node guy or a project manager. Um, anyone could try and make a paper prototype because it's a sort of a, it's a leveler, it's a something that we can all be quite familiar with. It's going back to just playing with familiar materials. In fact, um, we did a project a little while ago called Dot Ready. Um, and I was at a uh, company that I've just left, but at the time I was, I was going to leave then. And then we suddenly got this project in. And I needed to stay to do it because it was a really important thing to me. Dot Ready is a, just a little um, Angular JS application um, which helps young people to 
come up with uh, a checklist of things that they want to talk to their doctor about, specifically around mental health. As someone who's suffered from mental health problems myself, I thought that was a really important thing. Uh, but also, um, for the process I thought was really good. This wasn't my idea, this was another organisation, a, a sort of a partner, if you will, who came up with this. But we actually got some young people um, who would benefit from this, perhaps, to actually do some of the paper prototyping themselves. We actually handed it off to them entirely to begin with. Of course we filtered down what their ideas were and we acted as professional designers and developers to, to augment what they came up with. But essentially we got them to actually build it. Uh, or to at least define what it was. Define the problem that needed solving. Because it was their problem after all, not our problem um, that we were trying to do. Um, I'm just going to uh, finish off now, but just leave you with this and one last question. So, uh, this is one of my favourite quotes about design. Design is a behaviour, not a department. And as I said earlier, I think um, that behaviour is, is deliberation and decision making. And that can be over something you can see, you can't see, something you hold, something you look at, something you feel, whatever. But it's just about making good decisions about how something is made or how something comes into being. And based on that definition, I think actually, although only a few people put their hands up early and said they were a designer, I think most people, if not all people in this room, whether they're, I mean, project managers even, they, uh, they have to organize meetings, and a badly designed meeting is bad, right? <laughs> um, so, um, I kind of want to know whether I'm changing anyone's mind, so I'm going to do it this way. Can everyone just put a hand in the air to begin with? So if everyone just puts one hand in the air, it could be left or right. So everyone's hands up. Great. Okay. Thank you. So put your hand down. If no, wait. <laughs> put your hand down. That would have been a point to say this time. Uh, put your hand down. If you think by my definition, you 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 really are a designer. Okay. And everyone else is going to have very tired hands by the end of the day. Thank you very much for listening. <coughs>